on a Tuesday evening in Orange County. We'll talk about atrial fibrillation. So my name is uh, Dr. Asim Desai. I'm part of Mission Heritage Heart Rhythm Specialists. I'm joined here today by my partner, Dr. Jay Tiongson. I believe he's patching into the call. Our partner, Dr. Hung, is hard at work at the hospital seeing patients with arrhythmias and stopping out electrical heart disease. So hopefully she'll get a chance to hop in, but at the end of the presentation, I'll give you guys our contact information. And we do encourage you after the call to reach out to us either through Chelsea or through Mission Hospital's website. We are again, Mission Heritage Heart Rhythm Specialists. And if you have a little pen to jot down and information, our phone number is 949-347-2822, 949-347-2822. So today is really meant to be somewhat informal, and Dr. Tiangson and I in particular were planning on doing a little bit of a back and forth discussion, almost like you're peering in on a conversation between the two of us as we talk about atrial fibrillation. AFib is an electrical epidemic. It is very, very common. Those of you who are on the call either may have it or know someone who has it. Chances are if you go to a party or start talking to a family member, someone knows someone who knows someone who has AFib. And September is AFib Awareness Month. And so this was started a few years ago, this AFib Awareness Month. And I think it's really important because AFib is a huge cause of stroke, a huge cause of congestive heart failure. And there is a lot of misinformation out there about AFib, largely because it's somewhat of a complex disease and it is very different person to person. So a couple of key themes for tonight's talk, AFib is a very individual disease. And so no two AFib patients are alike. And when you start talking and comparing stories about different treatment options that you may have had with other people, just really keep that in mind because some people may be treated with a drug, some people may be treated with an ablation or a pacemaker, or some people may just have lifestyle and risk factor modification to manage their ACEs. That's just really an important thing to keep in mind. So for today, we have a note, the only disclosure we have is that we're consultants for Biosense Webster, which is a uh, 3D mapping company and ablation company that we do very close work with when we do different procedures. And so again, to introduce the three of us, myself, Dr. Asim Desai, Dr. Lin Hung, and Dr. Jay Tiangson are over at 26800 Crown Valley Parkway, right next to Mission Hospital. And our philosophy at Mission Heritage Heart Rhythm Specialists is that referring healthcare providers and their patients are the most important visitors in our office. They are not dependent on us actually we are dependent on them and they're not an interruption in our work. They are the purpose of it. All of you on this call are the purpose of our work. They're not outsiders in our practice. They're an important part of it. And we are not doing them a favor by serving them. They are, and you are doing a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. So we really take that seriously. And we do thank you for your trust in helping to take care of you. I love this quote by Helen Keller. Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. And our title tonight is Overcoming AFib. And overcome, if you look at the dictionary definition, it doesn't mean that you actually cross the finish line and the disease is done with. It means that you're hitting this disease head on. You're becoming informed, which is why you're on this call today. You'll become prepared. And then that way you can be in control of your treatment regimen. You can create your healthcare team. You can create your social support network. That is how you manage this disease. That's how you prevent it. And that's how you treat it. So let's start talking about Esther. Esther is a patient of ours at our medical group. Esther is an 80 year young woman from Germany who has a history of high blood pressure and anxiety. She was referred actually by a doctor up in Newport Beach, a cardiologist up in Newport Beach, who rather than refer Esther to Hogue, had heard about our program down in South Orange County about our electrophysiology program and referred her down here. She actually had a robotic heart procedure called ablation done down here. And she has a history of high blood pressure and anxiety. She presented to this doctor's office with just profound fatigue, shortness of breath and dizziness. And her physical exam showed a blood pressure of 180 over 90 and a heart rate of 120 beats per minute. So uh, forgive me for talking all on the first slide. This is a picture of the three of us, myself, Dr. Hung and Dr. Tiangson. Here's the quote from Helen Keller that I mentioned. So let's go back to Esther. So now this is Esther. So she presents to the doctor's office with high blood pressure, very rapid heart rate, and she was in congestive heart failure. Her ankles were swollen. We listened to her lungs. She had evidence of water in her lungs called pulmonary edema. And an electrocardiogram was done or an EKG. That's the fundamental test 
in heart rhythm medicine. And here you have several different stickers that are placed across the chest and the arms and the legs. And these are vantage points. These little stickers basically give a, a view into the heart's electrical system, looking at the heart, at the organ itself from different, from different vantage points. It's almost like you have these different watchtowers looking at the heart impulses. And if someone's in a fib in the doctor's office, then the EKG will pick it up. Many times people go in and out of AFib. And so when you show up to a doctor's office, you actually may be in a normal rhythm. And people often ask, well, I've been seeing my doctor regularly. Why wasn't my AFib picked up? It's for that reason that AFib is just like a problem with your car's engine. You know, you take it to the mechanic, everything is working out fine. And then you act up that night and you bring it back to the mechanic and it is acting fine. AFib is very, very similar. So when we look at Esther's EKG, I'll show you a normal EKG in a minute, but Here's the EKG for Esther and these different letters, one, AVL, AVF, V3, all these different letters and number combinations you see, those are the different electrodes. Those are the different vantage points of the heart. And I think you can just see just in, the, in this picture, you see all these little squiggles and all these little spikes. And it's, it, it has the appearance of chaos. It almost looks like noise, right? It almost looks like just there's no organization to what you're seeing on the screen. That's AFib. AFib is cardiac chaos. It's chaos in the electrical system. It's like having a tornado in your chest. And so if we look at the EKG for Esther on the left-hand panel, and we look at the middle panel, which shows normal sinus rhythm, and it shows a little tiny blip, and then a spike, and then a blip, and then a spike, and a blip and a spike. The blip represents the top two chambers contracting, the atria. The spike represents the top or the bottom two chambers contracting the ventricles. And there should be a one-to-one -one contraction pattern. Two on the top, two on the bottom, two on the top, two on the bottom. Well, if we look on the right-hand panel, now we get a close-up view. So the top line you see here is Esther's EKG. So you, you can see that red arrow is pointing to almost what looks like noise. And then you see these spikes, which are the heartbeat, versus the bottom panel, which is the normal EKG. And here you can see that purple arrow showing the little hump, which is the atrium contracting normally, that normal sinus rhythm. So this just gives you an idea kind of of what we're looking at when we're looking at AFib and people often ask, well, how do you diagnose it? Here's one way you diagnose it is on the uh, EKG. The heart's an engine, simply put. So you have plumbing, which is the coronary arteries, the three coronary arteries. So if those are blocked, that can cause a heart attack. You have valves, so you can have leaky valves or narrowed valves. So many of you may have heard about TAVRs, which are of ways that we can replace the aortic valve with the catheter, for example. And then you have the electrical system and the electrical system runs through the center portion of the heart. And so with AFib, the hallmark is it's a chaotic electrical rhythm. And you can see on the right panel, this, this picture here is of a heart in AFib versus this picture of a heart in normal sinus rhythm. And we'll get back to that in just a second. With regards to AFib, so You'll hear us call it electrical cancer, and that's kind of a powerful term to use, right, to compare it to cancer, but really that's what it is. It is a disease that is progressive. Every episode of every AFib, if it's five minutes, if it's an hour, if it's five seconds, there are lots of studies that show that the heart is a muscle and it gets a muscle memory such that when you go into an episode of AFib, that heart remembers AFib such that it wants to go into it again. And we used to think, well, someone has an episode once or twice a year, yeah, not a big deal. Well, it turns out that every episode is a big deal. And we have seen far too many patients get referred to us late in the disease process when the disease has already progressed. And why is this important? Well, just like cancer, if you intervene late, you will have a, a more negative outcome versus if you intervene early. So theme for today, early detection AFib, early intervention of AFib, best result. And that is a big theme here. And so what you really want to be thinking about at home is, if you do have AFib, how are you monitoring it? If you don't have AFib, how are you going to screen yourself for it? And there's so many amazing devices, consumer devices now available, whether it's the Apple Watch, whether it's the Cardia Mobile. You know, these devices aren't perfect, but they we've had many people actually make their own diagnosis of AFib when they come into our office. They bring in the tracing. And I want to again, underscore the fact that this talk today is not medical advice. And so we'll definitely be fielding questions throughout the talk, but I wanna encourage you to talk with your own doctors if you have specific questions about your condition and just know that AFib specialists like ourselves, electrophysiologists, 
are, are present throughout the world. And there are many here in Orange County and the three of us that are here at Mission Hospital and Mission Heritage Medical Group are here at your service. So AFib is electrical cancer. It's the most common heart rhythm disorder worldwide. So one in 40 people, or sorry, I, I should say one in four, one in four people over the age of 40 at some point in their life will get AFib. That means 25% of the people on this call at some point over age 40 will get AFib. Why? Because it's arthritis of the electrical system. So just as you get scar tissue or arthritis in your knees or in your hips, you get it in your electrical system. And that scar tissue buildup in the electrical system creates short circuits. And the short circuits creates that cardiac chaos of atrial fibrillation. There is AFib accounts for about 750,000 hospitalizations per year and almost up to 150,000 deaths per year. So it's quite staggering in terms of its burden on the healthcare system. And the three big consequences of AFib, stroke, congestive heart failure, and reduced quality of life. Those are the big three. Now, in recent years, we've learned a lot of research that AFib is actually an independent risk factor for the development of dementia, and in particular, Alzheimer's dementia. So there's this very interesting research coming out now that shows AFib is linked to dementia, and it turns out if you treat AFib, and in particular with catheter ablation in some cases, you can actually lower a patient's risk of dementia. So it's an exciting area of research, and obviously dementia is a huge medical problem. So anything that we can do to reduce someone's risk of dementia is a big deal. So again, with AFib, there's about a five times increased risk of heart failure, about a five times increased risk of stroke that can be the most debilitating event to happen to a person. If you poll people, most people would rather die than have a stroke because having a stroke means that there's the potential for being a burden to your loved ones. And there's a significant increased risk of overall cardiovascular mortality. I mentioned earlier, AFib is electrical cancer. AFib is a progressive disease. This slide is designed to show you. On the left hand of the panel of this slide, someone's first episode of AFib, it takes on average about 19 months to develop another episode. So a little bit over, not quite two years, but sort of between that one and two year mark. And then in another 34 months, having even more episodes. And by the time 44 months go by, so only a few years, from the time of their first episode, from the time of their first episode, a few years later, that you can get permanent AFib, continuous AFib. That's how rapidly it can progress. So to go from recurrent bout of paroxysmal AFib, where it's self-limiting, where you go in and out of it, to permanent AFib can be as short as a couple of years. So 20% of people, one out of five people of patients progress from their first paroxysmal episode of AFib to persistent continuous AFib within a year of diagnosis. So 20% of people. So you got to take it seriously. We used to say just, you know, the one episode, let's see what happens. Let's do the testing. That one episode can be the start of an avalanche. And so you really want to take that very seriously. And so spotting AFib, what are some of the symptoms? Well, the challenge with the electrical issues of the heart, in particular AFib, is you don't get the standard heart symptom. So when you think of the heart and you think of heart attacks, you think of chest pain, right? You think of pain in your chest, you think of dizziness and, and shortness of breath. Well, with AFib, you can get that. You can get chest pain and lightheadedness. You can get palpitations, which are a rapid or irregular heartbeat or a skipping heartbeat. But it turns out a lot of people, especially people with persistent AFib, where they're in it continuously and they weren't really sure when it started, they just have fatigue. They just feel really tired. They don't feel good. They, and so many people ascribe it to their age. They think, well, I, you know, I'm just kind of getting older. And yeah, sure, over the last six months, I haven't had as much energy, but it was because I wasn't as physically active until they show up to their doctor's office and find out that the heart rate's 120 and irregular, like Esther. Like Esther just thought she was kind of short of breath and not feeling great. And it turns out she was an AFib. So that's an important piece is that when you're fatigued, the most common causes of fatigue are still poor sleep, dehydration, stress, and food related, you know, sort of not the ideal diet. That, that's still the most common reason for fatigue. And of course, medications can cause fatigue. But always think of AFib. AFib, and especially if you're in a risk category, you're over the age of 65, you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure, any kind of heart disease, obesity is a big one. 
sleep apnea, heavy alcohol use, thyroid disease. These are all different risk factors for AFib. And if you have any of those risk factors, you really got to be always thinking about monitoring your heart rhythm. Learn how to take your pulse, check your carotid artery, check your radial artery. Those are very simple ways to do that. And then, of course, now Apple has the Apple Watch Series 4, 5, 6, and 7. All of those have the ability to monitor for AFib. There's a very, uh, variety of other products on, uh, on out there that can do that. And then even simple blood pressure machines like Omron and other companies make blood pressure machines that detect an irregular heartbeat, and that can be very helpful. But just keep in mind, fatigue, I've even had one gentleman actually who was just depressed, like that was his symptom of AFib. And when we restored his rhythm, we realized that a symptom of depression was from AFib. If you're not getting blood around your body, if your engine, your heart engine is not working well, you know, when you go into AFib, you go from a V6 to like a V4 or even less than that. And so it makes sense that when your engine is not working well, you just don't feel well. And sometimes that's even a hard thing to put into words. So AFib, I alluded to this earlier, that AFib, we have paroxysmal AFib here in green. That's early onset AFib, using that idea of electrical cancer, early cancer limited cancer, you know, whether it's prostate or breast or colon or lung, limited, you can cut the tumor out. With AFib, similarly, you can actually, we used to not like to use the word cure. And I think to some degree, we still don't like to use the word cure. And that's only because AFib is one of those diseases that you always have to be vigilant about monitoring for. Uh, unfortunately, it's a chronic disease. It's not, it's not a disease where you have a procedure like an ablation or you're on a drug and you're done with it. You have to constantly monitor. And it's no different than high blood pressure or diabetes. Those are conditions where you learn to live with them, you manage them, and you live a life. You live a full life. And it doesn't mean you can't live a full life when you have AFib, but you just have to really be vigilant about monitoring it. But with paroxysmal AFib, you go in and out of atrial fibrillation. These are episodes whereby you go out of rhythm and then your body self-corrects. And then it can progress to persistent AFib here in yellow. So persistent AFib in yellow, that's where you go into AFib and you're in it for several days and you need some kind of intervention such as a cardioversion, shocking the heart back into rhythm to get back into rhythm. And then we have long-standing persistent, which means you've been in AFib continuously for over a year. And then we have permanent AFib, which means it's more of a decision that the doctor and the patient say, We've done everything we can to restore the rhythm. We've done an ablation or a drug or what have you, and we just can't keep you in rhythm. And it doesn't make sense to keep going down that path. The, the risk of treatment is greater than the benefit. That's what we call permanent AFib. So permanent AFib is more of a treatment decision to say, we're going to focus rather on keeping you in rhythm. We're going to focus on just your quality of life and preventing your heart rate from getting too fast. So types of AFib, paroxysmal, persistent, long-standing persistent and permanent. These are the different stages of electrical cancer of the heart. And based on the stage that you're in will dictate your success rate of treatment. Now we used to say people who are in long-standing AFib that they have a low chance of being in normal rhythm. That is no longer the case. Michigan Hospital is a hospital that provides a lot of different treatments for people who are in continuous long-standing AFib. Many of us have been able to get people into AFib that have been in AFib for years. And we use a variety of different techniques and tools. You got to work on the risk factors, weight management, alcohol intake, diabetes. And then we use different ablation treatment options. We use a procedure called conversion ablation I'll talk about. We use a variety of different technologies. One's called Acutus. We use cryo balloon. We use radio frequency ablation. We use drugs. We use antiarrhythmic drugs. So it's really, you know, again, it's that cancer idea. With cancer, you have chemo, you have surgery, you have radiation therapy. AFib treatment's no different. Sometimes we cut out the tumor with an ablation. Sometimes we use a drug. Sometimes we use a drug in conjunction with a pacemaker. So you get the idea. We have an armamentarium of treatments, which is why the theme with AFib is always get an opinion from someone who manages AFib on a regular basis. So that can start with your primary care doctor, that can start with your cardiologist, but always have a low threshold to find out, hey, you know, is it worth me seeing an AFib specialist? An AFib specialist is a cardiac electrophysiologist or heart rhythm doctor or EP. 
myself, Dr. Tiangsen, Dr. Hung. There are many other doctors in the community that are EP doctors in different medical groups. There's a lot of great EP doctors in Southern California and across the country. And Heart Rhythm Society, HRS, is a great resource. You can go online, hrsonline.org. That's a place where you can find different heart rhythm specialists around the world, actually. On this slide, on the right portion of the slide, we see that the incidence and prevalence of AFib goes up significantly with age. So it's projected that in 2050, almost 16 million people will have atrial fibrillation. Right now, it's estimated about 6 to 7 million people in the U.S. have AFib. It's estimated that in about 2050, it's going to be about 16 million. So that's a pretty staggering number. So we talked about the risk factors of AFib. I kind of alluded to it, but let's go over that in particular. So this is one of my favorite analogies. You know, we talked about cancer. We talked about arthritis. Let's talk about a fire. You know, we live in California, so obviously we're plagued with fires. So AFib is the fire, and then you have the wood. So the wood are the risk factors that in the right combination will create a kindling or a dryness of the wood that sets up the ability for that word to take off and catch on fire. And then the match or matches are what we call the triggers of a given episode. So if we think of the fire as AFib, we think of the wood as the risk factors and we think of the matches as the triggers, we use that model. So the risk factors of AFib would be age, Premature atrial beats, we used to say that these were benign, PACs. It turns out in the right patient, if someone's genetically predisposed to AFib or has other risk factors, that can be a risk factor. Obesity is a big one. So many of our patients have had their AFib significantly improved by just losing weight. Intermittent fasting, Mediterranean diet, weight watchers, some kind of calorie counting program, it really makes a difference. Weight loss, is almost probably equally effective than any of the other AFib treatments we have. And in fact, there's studies that show that if you have people go into an ablation procedure and someone controls their risk factors and someone does not, the person who controls their risk factors are going to have a lot better outcome. So a lot, it, it's all about expectations. You can't go into a treatment and not treat the whole person. If a person is significantly overweight and they have an ablation procedure, they are inherently going to have a higher chance of recurrence because AFib comes from within the heart and outside the heart. That's the way to think about this disease, from within the heart, which is what we ablate or treat with meds, and outside of the heart, which is the diabetes and the high blood pressure and the alcohol intake and everything else. And so if we go around this circle, we look at obesity, we look at valvular heart disease, heart failure is a risk factor for AFib, heart failure can cause AFib, and AFib can cause heart failure. We have a very much of a chicken and egg vicious cycle phenomenon going on. Diabetes, high blood pressure, Sleep apnea, 50%, 50% of people with AFib have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea comes in two flavors. You have obstructive sleep apnea, where your tongue obstructs your airway. That can happen either because of obesity and a large neck. It can happen because of anatomic predisposition. And you can also have central sleep apnea, where the brainstem that controls your breathing, there's an impairment there. With central sleep apnea, you won't hear snoring necessarily. The person will just stop breathing. So if you snore, if you wake up and you don't feel rested, if you fall asleep during the day, those are, those are indicators that you could have had sleep apnea. And we have a very low threshold to recommend evaluation. And sleep apnea doesn't mean CPAP. There's lots of different treatment options. And if you're unhappy with your treatment of sleep apnea, then you need to go and get it checked out and maybe go somewhere else to get it evaluated because it needs to get treated to have a good result with ablation. And so this picture, by the way, that you're looking at this graphic, this is a picture of the left atrium, and it's just showing the four pulmonary veins in case you're wondering what that big gray blob is in the middle. So we talked about the triggers. So the triggers are the matches, right? The AFib is the fire, the risk factors are the wood, the triggers. So what causes someone to have a specific episode on a specific day? If they're dehydrated, if they're having alcohol, alcohol is both a risk factor if you're consuming a lot, as well as a trigger. And I mean like even one glass of wine can be a trigger for someone who has AFib. Anyone who's had an episode of AFib, alcohol can be a trigger. We are very, very proactive in telling people like, if you really wanna prevent this disease from coming back, stop drinking. There's data now that shows that if you infuse alcohol at the time of an ablation procedure, University of California, San Francisco researchers did this. They infused intravenous ethanol at the time of an ablation procedure, and they measured the electrical properties of the left atrium. 
and found that there were acute changes in the electrical activity of the atrium with alcohol, with small amounts of alcohol. The United Kingdom had a study of, of almost 40,000 patients, never a history of AFib, no risk factors for AFib, and alcohol consumption of one drink a day was an independent risk factor for AFib. So it's a big deal that alcohol is bad for the heart. It's bad for the heart when it comes to atrial fibrillation and with other arrhythmias in general as well. Electrolyte deficiency, especially magnesium and potassium. So we're big fans of eating foods high in magnesium and potassium, green leafy vegetables, certain fruits, uh, unsalted almonds. Caffeine can be a trigger. Exercise can be a trigger depending. There's, there's conditioned athletes that have very low resting heart rates. Um, endurance athletes that can get AFib, and there are specific reasons around the vagus nerve for that. Stress can be a trigger. Time of the day, people tend to get AFib more at night when they're sleeping because the heart rate slows down, the vagus nerve, nerve is active, and it can trigger an episode of atrial fibrillation. So those are the risk factors, the triggers, and then the disease. And we'll, how do we make the diagnosis? Well, we talked about Esther and we showed the EKG. To be honest, the EKG is rarely ever the test that diagnoses AFib. Unless someone comes into the ER with AFib, then we do an EKG and diagnose or if they're in the office. But for the most part, we have to use some kind of medical grade monitor. So on the left pan panel, we have the Holter monitor. That's a wired device that you can wear from anywhere from 24 hours for up to four weeks because we have certain Holters that can be worn for longer periods of time. They continuously record their rhythm. They can pick up any AFib. There's something called silent AFib, AFib that you don't feel. And so that's why it's important to have devices that can record all heartbeats. We have the patch monitors, which are almost like a Band-Aid that has a microchip that's waterproof that it just goes on the skin and it can record the rhythm. We have implantable devices that get injected underneath the skin, like a microchip that can record the rhythm and transmit wirelessly over cell phone networks to a cloud, and then we get that data uploaded to our office. And then, of course, you have the consumer products like smartphone-enabled monitors like the Cardio Mobile, and then you have like the Apple Watch EKG or Samsung has one now. I think Fitbit even has one now as well. So when we look at AFib, again, we're thinking about prevention of a stroke or prevention of heart failure and, and improvement of quality of life. So a stroke happens with AFib because the atrium is not contracting normally. It's, it's chaotic. The heart function is reduced. You lose 30% of the pump efficiency of your engine when you go into AFib. So what happens when the heart is not contracting right? The blood pools, a clot forms and breaks off and goes to the brain, or it can go elsewhere. We've had people where the clot's gone to their wrist or to their bowel and they have infarction of their bowel. So the clots can go anywhere, but most commonly go to the brain. So when we do an assessment of an AFib patient, we ask two questions. What's their risk of stroke if they're not on a blood thinner? And what's their risk of bleeding if they take a blood thinner? The CHADS VAS score, which is the acronym to determine stroke risk, and the HAS blood score, which is an acronym to determine bleeding risk. And you basically can sit down with your doctor. These are well validated in science, and you can do a calculation of what's your CHADS VAS and what's your HAS blood. And depending on that, we'll tell you what your annual chance of getting a stroke or major bleeding is. And that will help dictate then on the right panel what you should do. Should you be on an anticoagulant? That would include warfarin or apixaban, which is Eliquis, or dabigatrin, which is Pradaxa, or adoxaban, which is Cervasa, which I, is not really used as much anymore, rivaroxaban, which is Zeralto. So those are the drugs that we use to thin the blood to prevent a stroke. And then we have what are called left atrial appendage occlusion devices, LAAC. So that would include the Watchman, which is a little filter that we can put in the heart, 60-minute same-day procedure, very quick recovery. Mission Hospital is a, is, a, is a big site for implanting those. Dr. Tiongson and Dr. Sanjay Bojraj uh, from our Structural Heart Disease Program pioneered implanting Watchman at Mission. Dr. Hung does watch, and I do Watchman. Several of our other colleagues do Watchman. You have Watchman done at a variety of other facilities around here. So it's a really great option for people who either can't take a blood thinner because they have a bleeding risk or they've, they've had a stroke despite taking a blood thinner. But honestly, you only need a CHADS VAS score of two or higher and fit other criteria to be a candidate for Watchmen. So the, the indications for Watchmen are broad and, and many people are candidates. So it's always a worthwhile conversation to have with 
your doctor. Watchman is not better than blood thinners. It's equivalent in its ability to protect against stroke, but there is a lower bleeding risk. Watchman's done similar to a catheter ablation procedure. So we go into the femoral vein, we go up into the heart, and we deploy this basket. So it's got overall about a 1% complication rate, very high success rate. There's also the lariat device, the atriclip device, which is used often at the time of a convergent ablation procedure. And then there's a device called Ambulant, with Amulet, which has come out by Abbott St. Jude that's similar to Watchman. So that, there's a lot of cool technologies out there. And we have a structural heart program at Mission that is um, foundation of the program is Chelsea Zimmerman and Taylor Crohn. They are our amazing nurse practitioners, and they're the ones that are great contact uh, points if you want to learn more about things such as Watchmen and TAVR, for that matter, if you're interested in any kinds of percutaneous valve replacement procedures that are done at Mission. Cardioversion, that's shocking the heart back into rhythm. It's often a treatment we go to first when we have a patient with AFib. That's really only in people who have continuous AFib, persistent AFib. If you're paroxysmal and you're going in and out, then you're not going to shock the heart. But if you go into AFib and you can't get back into normal rhythm with drugs, then we're going to reset the rhythm. And we restart the heart. We reset the rhythm. And it's almost like turn, turning your computer on and off. If you have a broken wire, you shut the computer on and off, and sometimes it'll work. And that's the case with cardioversion. But sometimes the AFib comes back. So cardioversion doesn't cure AFib, it just resets the rhythm. What cures AFib is losing weight, addressing the risk factors, avoiding alcohol, taking a medicine, getting an ablation. Like those are the things that, again, we don't like to use the word cure, but in many cases we can eliminate the disease for a decent period of time. So that's basically in a, in a way saying cure, but be very careful. We don't do these procedures to get off blood thinners. You do these procedures to reduce AFib to improve quality of life. You can never have 100% guarantee AFib isn't going to come back. So you don't have an ablation so you can get off a blood thinner. You have an ablation where you take a drug in order to keep the rhythm at bay. If you're trying to get off a blood thinner, you have a discussion with your doctor about the pros and cons and the clinical indications and the CHADS VASC and the HASBLED, and you look at your different options of drugs or one of the left atrial appendage closure procedures. So cardioversion, its success rate varies depending on if how long you've been in AFib for. So if you've been in AFib for only a few days, the success rate is very high. If you've been in AFib for over a year, the success rate is quite low. So that'll also be a metric that we use to decide where in the treatment algorithm, there's like a discrete algorithm that we use that when we see a patient with AFib, we kind of go through a checklist of things. And it's all about a clock. You know, AFib, it's, the clock's ticking. Uh, every day you're in AFib, the disease is progressing. So it's important to manage everything at the same time. You get your diabetes checked and your weight loss as you're working on the AFib itself. And when we look at drugs, we have two classes of drugs. We have drugs to control the heart rate. So it does, the drugs don't do anything to restore the rhythm. They just control the heart rate from being too fast and preventing heart failure. And then we have drugs that actually control the rhythm. So there's drugs that restore the rhythm. There's drugs that if you shock a person back into rhythm, the drug is used to keep them in rhythm. Those are antiarrhythmic drugs. The problem is that in 2022, to date, the most effective drug we have, which is amiodarone, that has its role, but is really essentially chemotherapy because it causes massive problems in multiple organs in, in some patients. And that's the case for a lot of these drugs. At best, has only about a 50 to 60% success rate. So that is why you hear a lot about ablation. Not everyone is a candidate for ablation. Ablation should not be done in everyone, but it is, of all the treatments that we have, the most effective for atrial fibrillation in many, many patients, where you have success rates anywhere from 80 to sometimes 90 plus percent. With drugs, it's about 50 to 60 percent long term. So there's a role for drugs, just like in cancer, there's a role for surgery, there's a role for chemo, there's a role for radiation. With AFib, there's a role for ablation, there's a role for drugs, there's a role for cardioversion, there's a role for pacemakers that we can talk about as well. But you got to weigh the risk to benefit. And also has to do with the frequency of AFib. If someone is not in AFib that much, maybe once or twice a year, sometimes we do a pill in the pocket approach. If the person can feel AFib, they take a drug to help convert them back to sinus rhythm. So there's a lot of different ways that you can spin this. And again, it gets back to what I said in the beginning. No two AFib patients are the same. 
if we look at ablation, ablation all is all about identifying the problem spots. It's an electrician like ourselves, an electrician for the heart. And we use these really advanced technologies to record electrical signals in the heart through a minimally invasive approach. That recording of the signal translates into color. So we're essentially painting the heart, this cardiac canvas. We use these different catheters with the multiple electrodes that you can see here that really almost look like paintbrushes. And we move them through the heart, rapidly collects data and translates it to color. So the color that you see in the screen is a color of your heart and it's showing the abnormal electrical circuits and we can actually do a before and after where we ablate and we look at color before and after. And when you see the colors change, it tells you that the abnormal signals have been eliminated. So that's actually how you tell you have an effective result from ablation, but the true test is gonna be time. But ablation, simply put, is a strategy that is used where you use an energy source to destroy abnormal tissue. So ablation is done in the heart, ablation is done in the spine, ablation is done in the uterine artery for bleeding fibroids. So you can use ablation in a variety of different ways. You have radio frequency, which is heating, which is cauterizing the circuits. You have freezing, which is cryoablation. We have all of these available at Mission Hospital. At Mission, we're fortunate to actually have stereotaxis, which is a robotic catheter ablation that uses magnetic fields. So rather than the doctor pushing a catheter through the heart, we actually have magnetic uh, electrodes uh, on the catheter. And there's magnets around the patient that we literally pull the heart in a very elegant way through the body using a computer mouse. It's a phenomenal piece of technology. So the bottom line with AFib, when you're talking about ablation, is you're targeting the pulmonary veins, the four pulmonary veins in the left atrium. These are the sources of AFib. Think of a castle, think of the AFib in the castle. We're creating a moat around the castle with ablation. We're creating a circle around that fire. That fire, we're trying to insulate that fire. And so we insulate it with an ablation procedure. And so the veins are the big culprit, but sometimes other parts of the heart are the culprit. So when someone's in paroxysmal early AFib, the veins are the vast majority of the time the culprit. When someone's been in AFib a long time, other areas are involved. In particular, the posterior wall, the back part of the left atrium. The back part of the left atrium, the posterior wall, is an area that is known to be a problem and can contribute to AFib sustaining. And so convergent is an ablation procedure where an EP doctor and a cardiothoracic surgeon our partners, they work together. So it's a two-stage procedure, it's a hybrid procedure. The first step is the surgeon. The surgeon ablates the outside of the heart. So up until now, when I was talking about ablation, I was talking about ablating from within the heart through the femoral vein into the heart, the endocardial aspect of the heart. The surgeon ablates the outside of the heart. Why is this important? Well, I'll be honest, this is not a good analogy, but it's the best one I can think of. And it's hard actually for me to say it because I'm vegetarian, but, if you take a piece of steak and you try to cook it from just one side or a piece of chicken from just one side, it's hard to get the energy all the way through to cook the other side of the steak. Well, you got to flip it on both sides. And in the same way with ablation, what we're trying to do from within the heart is cauterize and get the energy all the way to the other side. Well, why does AFib come back after an ablation procedure? And sometimes it's because you can't get that energy all the way through. So that's why a procedure like these hybrid ablation procedures, the maze procedure, for example, the mini maze procedure, or in this case, convergent, are being done so that you can target both aspects. Now, every time you go into a surgical approach, you're going to deal with more invasive treatments. You're going to deal with higher risk. The nice thing about convergent is that the surgeon can do everything through small little scopes. So it's relatively lower on the invasive side of things. And the other big advantage of conversion is the surgeon can put a clip around the left atrial appendage to get someone off a blood thinner. So kind of like a watchman device, the surgeon can put what's called an atrial clip, a little clip, and does the same thing as the watchman in a sense. So the convergent procedure, the surgeon goes in and ablates the back part of the heart, the posterior wall, and then the EP goes in six to eight weeks later, maps out what the surgeon did, and completes the lesion set. So usually does pulmonary vein ablation, usually does what's called an atrial flutter ablation. And so on this particular graphic, what you're looking at in the center, all these different colors, that's all the abnormal tissue that's present in someone who's been in AFib for a long time. For someone who's been in AFib a short time, you usually just see purple in the middle. So again, cancer, electrical cancer, early electrical cancer AFib, it's gonna be just purple. 
with metastatic electrical cancer of AFib, you're going to see all of this additional color. And so when you see the color become red, red means the signal is eliminated. So these are the kinds of pictures we can show our patients as a before and after. AV node ablation is kind of the final frontier of ablation. So it was done a lot in the past until we got really good at restoring rhythm with AFib ablation. So when you hear about AFib ablation, usually we're referring to ablating the left atrium. AV, AV node ablation is ablating the central portion of the electrical system called the AV node. There, the heart rate goes really, really slow. So you have to put a pacemaker in, or if someone already has a pacemaker, then they don't need the pacemaker. So AV node ablation is coupled with the pacemaker. The goal here is not to keep the top rhythm back into normal sinus rhythm. The goal here is just to control the heart rate. So this is usually done in people that we've been unsuccessful in keeping them in sinus rhythm, that we switch the strategy. And with an AV node ablation, even though the atrium is still fibrillating, you're controlling the pulse rate. So you don't notice it because we can control the pulse rate and get it at 70 beats a minute, nice and even. And it definitely has its role. The downside is that you are pacemaker dependent. So the underlying heart rate is really low. So if the pacemaker were to fail, that could be a serious problem. Fortunately, that does ha not happen that often. And the cool thing nowadays is we have all sorts of pacemakers. We have the traditional two-wire system, the one-wire system. We have a leadless pacemaker, which is a little pellet that can be put in the heart. And you can't even tell you have a pacemaker. It's pretty phenomenal stuff. So when you get diagnosed with AFib or you're going for that first doctor's office visit, you know, be prepared. Like, go in. Do your research. You're on this call today. Follow up with us. Re reach out to Chelsea. Send us a message to ask, you know, those questions, those critical questions. And we can make sure you guys get access to these slides and these handouts so, so that you can have access to some of this information because I know I'm going through it in kind of an overview. But here are some just general questions that you can ask, like what is AFib and how serious is it? And why don't I feel any symptoms? And am I at risk for a stroke? You know, that's the what is AFib question. And then you can ask about testing. What testing should I have done? Do I have an electrolyte imbalance? You ask about lifestyle. Do I need to make any lifestyle changes? What, what physical activity do I need? Am I able to do or not able to do? And then you look at all the different medication and treatment options. So it's good to kind of go in with this sort of list of questions. Your doctor honestly will appreciate it because it'll make the visit a lot more efficient. So when we close and look at you, us, our patient, we look at this, this team you have, your primary care physician, your cardiologist, your electrophysiologist, your other doctors, your endocrinologist, your neurologist, and we all need to talk and we all need to be part of that team and your loved ones. And that's the key. The key is communication. The key is to, um, that's a reminder to tell me to wrap it up to make sure you guys have enough time for questions. But that's that's the key, is to communicate and build your healthcare team. So remember that AFib is a progressive disease. It requires a holistic treatment approach, mind-body, mind-body approach. Food is medicine. I didn't even talk about that, but there's the AFib diet. My colleague, John Day from Utah, he's got a great book called The AFib Cure. And in that book, there's a chapter that's called The AFib Diet. And John does a wonderful job with his colleague, Jared Bunch, discussing like the, 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 the electrolytes that you should take, the supplements you should avoid. It's a great book in that regard, the AFib cure. So AFib is a progressive disease. It requires a holistic approach. If you suspect that you have AFib, see a specialist like an electrophysiologist, like Dr. Tiangson, like Dr. Hong or myself. If, if you um, seek out those resources, you can become informed, prepared, and in control. And I'll leave you with two quotes. I'm all about quotes. I love quotes because I was a philosophy major, I suppose. The goal of life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe, to match your nature with nature. Joseph Campbell, famous meditation teacher. And from the Petit Prince, the Little Prince book by Antoine saint Exupéry, it is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. So thank you very much for joining us tonight on your Tuesday night. Feel free to reach out to us after today's session. I'm going to go ahead and leave this slide up so you have a chance to write it down. Jay Tiangson, Lynn Hung, and myself, we're heart rhythm specialists. 26800 Crown Valley, Suite 103. We're right at the corner of Crown Valley Medical Center Road, our phone number, 347-2822. And here's our website address. Um, it's a little complicated, but it's basically bit.ly 
forward slash mission HRS. And we'll have all that, I think, with uh, Chelsea, I think, put a lot of information into the chat here. So 